Hello and welcome to another episode of Webflow and Code, where I teach you the underlying code you're writing in Webflow. Today, we're going to be looking at Framer and taking an even closer look at some of its components. Now, it's no surprise in Framer that they guide you towards using their pre-built component to get you up and running with a website without doing much at all, really. But what I want to do is take a deeper look at some of these components from a HTML perspective and see what we can learn from looking at some of this stuff. Now, it'd be easy for you to think that I'm hating on Framer on this episode, which I'm really not. If you check out my review, I think it's a great tool and perfect for those just getting involved in web development. There's a bigger message that I want to get to at the end of this episode. But without further ado, let's jump into Framer and take a look at some of their pre-built components. So I've got a page here that I've recreated containing some of the components that I think Framer should take a closer look at. Now, if you're brand new to Framer, basically in here, in the, in the inset menu, and this is what I mean about they're kind of pushing you towards using their pre-built components. And immediately you're presented with a bunch of beautiful pre-built components. You've got some nav components here and you've even got pre-built pages. You can drag these onto your page and start to use them. And then you can preview your Framer website just like this. You can tell I've been using Framer and doing a little bit of research. So in this preview here, I could publish it, but this is fine to do a preview here. The first component we're going to take a look at is the navigator and I can inspect the generated HTML here. Generally, I do think there is an excess amount of HTML that Framer writes, but it's not a deal breaker. It's not that big a deal. It's just something of note. Now, the biggest offender in the nav bar specifically is that there's no nav. So a nav element defines the main navigation links of a page and you can do this yourself you can go here component here find our wrapping element and then we go down to accessibility and then we can select that as a tag there so it's easily done but when you have this idea of pre-built components that are kind of good ready to go and ready for you to use you'd expect framer to have already kind of done that the next one we're going to look at is again fairly simple uh, this element here is it's actually defined as a button. Not really sure why, but if we are to take a look at sort of the HTML spec, a button is used for interactivity, such as form submissions, or if you click this, a menu will open or something like that. Whereas a link is actually navigating you to another page or another section of that page. And I would expect that read more is exactly that, a linking to another page. It could open up a dialogue, which then becomes a button, uh, but there's nothing tied to this. I'm not really sure why this is a button. So again, these aren't really deal breakers because what Framer does, which again is great, is once you make that into a link by clicking link and then selecting your page, it actually turns it into a link, which is really, really good. It recognizes that you wanna make that clickable, so it just does some of this stuff automatically. Another one here is the kind of default contact form here. If we preview that, scroll down and inspect our code. Now, part of the HTML spec is that you should have labels with your inputs. It's not great practice to have a placeholder as to be used as the, the label, but it would be better to have like an ARIA label here, a ARIA label or ARIA title to say insert name or something like that. Another one could be here is that we, I don't think we actually have an action on this form, which tells me that it, it submits via JavaScript, which is not so great because if for whatever reason you turn off JavaScript or JavaScript hasn't loaded, if the form has an action attribute which tells it exactly where to send that data to, this website, your website can work without JavaScript. So that's just another practice, um, bad practice that they're following there. I'll take this moment to say if you are enjoying this episode, then I encourage you to like and subscribe. It really helps me and the channel out to keep producing this kind of content. Anyway, this one was really weird. I got really confused. You've got a basic drop down here. And when I uh, inspected it, to me, this would be a button. It's a button, an interactive element that when you click it, something happens. You could use a summary in detail. I'll leave a link to that HTML element below, but it's essentially doing the same thing. But I couldn't find a button anywhere. And then I was thinking that maybe they've got an on-click handler tied to a div, which is terrible because you can't focus on a div. Then I tabbed down and I realized, oh, you can 
focus on these. So, but there's nothing in here that's actually focusable. How they've achieved it is really bizarre. Again, I don't know why they've done this, but they put a tab index of zero. So what tab index does, it puts that element in the tab order that you define. Minus one removes it completely, so it's not tabbable. Point is that they've achieved this focusable element with the tab index, which is bizarre, interesting to say the least. I describe this stuff as free functionality. If you were to use a button, it's focusable, you get interactive states like hover and focus, and you also get certain attributes that aren't available on, say, like a div, which is what they've used. So we're really encouraged to use the right elements for the right job, and then you get this free functionality. Lastly, this review here, you've got this quote. I don't think this actually uses a quote. It's actually a H2, so that's a bad practice there. That is not a heading. Reviews, presumably reviews is also a H2. Yeah, so you've got two H2s that are in line that there's no association with each other. Really, some of these things aren't going to break your website. It's not, it's not a big deal. I know I talk a lot about semantics and accessibility. It's not going to stop your website working. Your website will be a better website, but it's not going to break. And that's the most important thing. Quickly, I actually had a conversation with veteran of the web world, Chris Coyer. And I was recently taking a look at the interview that I, or the podcast that I did with him. And I asked him about this idea that we're creating websites that don't have the right semantics. And his response was something I've been thinking about a lot recently. And he basically said, as long as your website works, it's fine. It's just when the browsers choose to not support that or implement what you've created, implement what you've written in a new way, that breaks your website, that's when it becomes a problem. But I do think those two ideas come in hand in hand, that if a browser chooses not to implement, you know, a browser chooses not to implement a website that only contains divs or it just breaks or you miss out on a really cool feature because you've built your website with divs, then that's when it starts to become a problem. Now we get to the whole message behind this episode. And that is that when we rely too much on tools like Framer, like Webflow, that make certain assumptions on what you're trying to do or inevitably write a lot of code under the hood, we, we become too dependent on them. And when, if they make a mistake or if they break something, we are completely locked into that ecosystem. You're a designer and you're in the business of now building websites. Design and look and feel of a website is only half the story. A website needs to function through the code. And that comes down to, as I say, accessibility and SEO, but also browsers. And who knows what other technology in the future will be dependent on the code that you write. So learn to interrogate and learn to fix these problems. Continue to learn, continue to remain curious and understand the code and the magic that's happening underneath these brilliant, fascinating tools. I'll leave you with that message. And until next time, happy no coding.